morning, everyone, in YouTube land. This morning's scripture is James chapter 1. It says, This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the twelve tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed in the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. So believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. And afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say that God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and they drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, become his prized possession. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you this morning for this beautiful sunny day. I just pray that as your messenger this morning, that I'm also touched by your word as it speaks to me as well. So we give this morning to you and we praise your most holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've entitled this sermon, I Don't Get That, because sometimes we read scripture like this. It's so hard to take in. It's hard to process and to understand, because sometimes I find Paul's teachings a little harsh. When we think of this beautiful world that God has created on all the mountains and the hills, the fields of wildflowers, the sandy beaches, It's hard to take in when we're brought back down to earth. James chapter 1. Count it all joy, he says, when you face trials and troubles. Well, trials and troubles don't fit into our moments of happiness and serenity. I don't know about you, but my mind is usually far from wanting to suffer trials and tribulations in life. It usually sucks the joy right out of your soul. But here, James is encouraging us not to get so deep into our grief and forget that God still loves us and is right here with us during our times of trouble. And I apologize, I said Paul, I mean James. James and Paul are both sometimes hard to take in. When we find ourselves in the middle of a horrible situation, we must first understand that God did not send this to punish us for anything wrong. That's not the kind of God we serve. He's not ready to hit us over the head with a gavel whenever we do something wrong. Through these trials and tribulation, though, there is room for growth. But it's not always easy to pass through the storm. Believe me, I've been there. I could have had a set of T-shirts to represent them. And so I go to these commentaries, and one of them says that in some English translations of the Bible, James 1, 2 contains the clause, count it all joy. It's the first command that James gives in his epistle. He asks us to understand what it means by it. 
We must look at the full passage, though, to understand it and all the surrounding verses. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The word count is this financial term. It means to evaluate. So when James says count it all joy, he's encouraging us to evaluate the way that we look at our trials. He calls us to develop a new and improved attitude that considers trials from God's perspective. James wants believers to know uh, to expect these trials because they're going to come sometime in our life. We should be prepared and not caught off guard when a sudden trial comes upon us. Trials are a part of the Christian experience. Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. Typically, a trial is not an occasion for joy. Of course, it is not. James isn't suggesting that we pursue trials or court hardship. Neither are we to pretend that trials are enjoyable to endure because they are not. Trials are difficult and they are very painful, but they exist for this purpose. Trials have the potential of producing something very good in us. And for this reason, they are an opportunity for expressing this joy. Knowing that there is a bigger picture, we can consider trials as something to rejoice in. Even though joy is contrary to our normal reaction when trials and tribulations occur, James urges us to work on changing our attitude toward troubles from dread to positive expectation to faith to trust, and to even joy. James does not merely say count it all joy, but he says count, to count it joy, but he says count it all joy. That is, we can consider trials and testings as pure, undiluted, total joy. But too often we see trials in this negative light, or we assume that joy cannot ever exist in hardship. Or worse, we consider the hard times as God's curse upon us or his punishment for our sin rather than what they really are, opportunities to joyfully mature into Christ-likeness. James 1.3 explains that God intends trials to test our faith, produce spiritual perseverance. Trials are like training challenges for an athlete. They build physical endurance and stamina. The athlete looks forward to physical and mental challenges because of the benefits that follow. If we were to walk through life on easy street and never face hardship, our Christian character would remain untested and underdeveloped. Trials develop our spiritual muscles, giving us the stamina and endurance to stay on the course. We can count it all joy in trials because in them we learn to depend solely on God and to trust only in him. Faith that is tested becomes genuine. It becomes rugged. It becomes uncompromising. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. 1 Peter 1, 6-7. God also allows trials to discipline us. God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness, Hebrews 12, 10. Trials help to purge our spiritual shortcomings and mature us up in faith. They promote joy because they produce holiness in the life of all the steadfast believers. And so James encourages Christians to embrace these trials, not for what they presently are, but for the outcome that God will accomplish through them. He promises, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. But I still, I take it in and I think it sounds easy on paper, but in our lives, it is not always easy. 
It doesn't mean that we don't read these scriptures because we are to take them in. But as we've all probably faced some incredible trials and tribulations during those times, it is very difficult. But the fact is that God still loves us and he wanders and journeys with us as we're going through this. And he still cares about us through this. That is our hope, to hold on to a God that loves us. He will bring us through us through it with us. And when we hit that wall, he's going to open a door and get us through. I am a testament to that. I am. I've seen some times when I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. But he encouraged me to keep journeying through. And he opened up many doors for me. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers in Genesis 37, he could not see the beautiful life-saving outcome that God would accomplish through his many years of suffering and perseverance in Egypt. After his ordeal with Potiphar's wife, Joseph spent long years forgotten in prison. Eventually, God's plan came to fruition, and Joseph was raised up to the second most powerful position over Egypt. Through many trials and tests, Joseph learned to trust God. Not only, because, not only did Joseph rescue his family and the nation of Israel from starvation, but he saved all of Egypt. Joseph's faith had been tested through trials and perseverance. He finished its work. After coming through the trials victoriously, Joseph understood God's good purpose and all that he had endured. Joseph was able to see God's sovereign hand in it all. Mature and complete, Joseph spoke these words of forgiveness to his brothers. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. To count it all joy when we face trials, we must evaluate the difficulties in life with eyes of faith and see them in light of God's good purpose. The translation of James 1, 2 to 4 by J.B. Phillips aids in our understanding. He says, when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers and sisters, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until the endurance is fully developed and you will find that you have become men and women of mature character with the right sort of independence. But I still find it difficult to completely understand when you sit with someone whose life has been diminished by disease, when a family is grieving, when their child has been murdered, when someone you love has been snatched from you, when you receive your pink slip after 20 to 30 years of total loyalty, how do we explain to someone who has just received traumatic news to count it all joy? I really don't think we can. I think that we have to allow God to take care of that part, of that healing, of that journey. I think the best thing that we can do is come along their side, be their friend, and listen. Allow them to take their pain and produce words. Allow them to pour their heart out to you and to God. Allow God to do the rest. Sometimes it isn't until that we are passing through the storms of life do we personally understand what God is doing in the background. It isn't up to us to have all the right words, as Harry said yesterday at the induction, or to say the correct things, or to pray the best prayer. Only God fully understands the pain that we and someone else are going through. It's up to us to be the best friend to those who are suffering. I think it's only then do we get it, do we count the joy. As a pastor, I don't always have the right words. I sometimes don't even know what to pray sometimes with people or for people. But God does. So I go to him. We approach his throne of grace and sometimes just stand there and allow his spirit to move in us, sometimes to tears, because God 
understands tears. They are the most beautiful language known to people. Even when Jesus wept, he found out at that time, when he found out that Lazarus had died, the shortest passage in the Holy Scripture is Jesus wept. Jesus understands what we are going through when we go through them. He is always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He journeys with us. His spirit can be very, very strong. Like I've said before, when I laid on the couch, sleeping in the night to keep an eye on my dying mother, it was then that I could feel his power so strong, his spirit so evident. The comfort came to me in my dreariest moments of watching somebody deteriorate with cancer. Last night I got home from, I didn't add this to my sermon, so I'm going to add lib. Last night I came home, I journeyed out to get a few things at Walmart. I came home and I was kind of all wound up from all the excitement of the day. We had such a good night last night and then the induction service in the afternoon, it was beautiful. It was so lovely to see everybody just full of joy, getting along in unity, laughing, playing games and eating. We do, Baptists do that best, I think. We, we know how to put on a good spread and we know how to have fun. So last night I came home and I'd been wanting to watch this film. I was, I was, I was warned that it could trigger. And it did. It was called A Man Called Otto. He suffered greatly. I don't want to give away the story because I want everyone to watch it. Tom Hanks knows how to take on a persona. He did it amazingly. This man suffered so much. He became a very cantankerous, nasty old man who lived on this street. And this beautiful Hispanic family moved right across the road from him, and they would not give up on him. They saw his pain. I don't want to give away too much. But sometimes we judge harshly against people when they're angry, when they don't count it all joy. When they suffer greatly, it's up to us as a family of God to come alongside of them. And when I finished that movie this morning before I came to church, I thought, wow, how many times have I judged people? How many times have I said, I don't want to hang around with them. They're nasty. They're mean-spirited without understanding first what they've journeyed through. Sometimes we're the product of what we go through. Sometimes we're the product of how we're treated. And when people are treated like that over and over and over again, it's easy to judge people when we see them without knowing their story. So I challenge you to watch the movie, A Man Called Otto. If you have Crave, it's on Crave. You may have to buy it. You may have to pay to rent it. But it opened up new doors for me. And it really, God really taught me a lesson when I watched this movie. And so as I end this sermon, I just want to say, when we lose our heroes, when we're children, when we go through immeasurable grief, it can take us years to understand. And myself, I understood it eventually. When my job was being cut back, I didn't get it at first, but it came at just the right time. God will take our losses, our grief, our pain, and make them into gains for us if we only trust in him. It isn't easy, but sometimes just maybe a little bit, we will see something to rejoice about. Amen. Our last hymn is Love Lifted Me. God bless you this week. May God be with you.